Axis and Allies 1914 was designed by Larry Harris and was launched in 2013. When he said he zoomed the game back, what he really did was strip away most of what made World War I, World War I. But because he zoomed so far back, he completely broke the game in more than one way. There is even a hack in the rules. This is the hardest Your Board Game Sucks review I think I'll ever have to do. I love Axis and Allies, as you can see. I am a bit of a World War I buff. Oh my God. I didn't shave my legs. a a has a bit of a cult following. Larry Harris designed this game right here. And just about every other Axis and Allies going all the way back to the early 80s. But they're all World War II games. So this one right here was an instant hit when it came out. If you're new to Axis and Allies, I would recommend this game right here. Axis and Allies 1941. This game is stripped way back and it just gives you an idea of how to play. You should, however, buy ANA 1942 Second Edition. More exciting, more intense, more grand epic scale. But these are all of the qualities that you would want to see in a World War I game. 1914 is a game for two to eight players. It says so right there. You can play this with two players the same way you can go to the DMV and stand in line with two people and then try and explain that to everyone that it was fun. The wife and I did a shrink removal and unbox. Now, it was incredibly painful because you cannot find these games new anymore. They are out of print and no one has them for a decent price. In this game, you are warring for victory in World War I. You can play as the Entente, which is the Allies, or you can play as the Central Powers. To win the game, all you have to do is take two capital cities from your enemies. Does that sound pretty easy? Well, it actually can be. You could be expecting an eight hour game and it ends in three hours. And I will touch on why that is in a little bit. Recently, I did a Your Board Game Sucks on Terraforming Mars. That one had no player interaction at all. Little player conflict, if any. In 1914, you are bayonet charging each other until one of you wins or everybody is killed. The game starts out with each nationality loading up the map using these charts on the boxes. With all of the pieces on the map in the correct spots representing the beginning of World War I. This game has a whopping five phases per turn. You only have to do one of these phases and that is collect income. First is purchasing and repairing units. You get to repair a damaged battleship at a seaport for free. Now, IPCs are the currency of Axis and Allies. You collect IPCs based on which territories you own on the map. Each territory has a number on it, and that has been kept track on the IPC tracker. Now you spend that income on new armies so that you can take more territory and earn more cash to build more armies. Then you move your armies, bringing your crazy strategies to life that you've been brewing this entire game. But you can't move into neutral territories without it rising up an army to defend itself against you. The same goes for a minor powers territory, except for they already have their alliance with a major power. They just have not been mobilized yet. So the next thing you do is resolve those battles by rolling an endless supply of dice. Now, if we're talking about a sea battle, those keep going until the battle is completely done. Land battles, that's a little bit different. Land battles happen one round at a time, and they only start after the fighters have figured out who owns air superiority. Now, after all of that, you deploy the units that you just purchased. But there's a kicker. You can only put the units you just purchased on your capital city, and you only get one of those. Any sea units, you can only put 
on a seaport that you originally owned. Now, Britain cheats because they have two capitals. You can put British units on London and you can put British units on Bombay, India. Now all you have to do is check the IPC tracker and collect all that money. Now, when you grab that cash, I guarantee you're gonna be huddled in the corner like an abused prisoner trying to hide it from everyone so they can't take it. These units, there is eight of them and each team has access to the same units. Like the X-Men, but way less tights. All units attack, defend, and cost all different values. Kind of like the laxative aisle at your pharmacy. I wonder what the attack value is on this one. Now each unit has their own place in the game, and it's quite interesting to see how they interact, not only on the map, but also on the battle board. So now that we have a good idea of what the gameplay is like in 1914, let me tell you about all of the ways it is completely broken. Larry Harris explains in the beginning of the rule book why he made this game. He said that he did it so we could give people a better understanding of World War I and also why World War II started the way it did. The units available are almost identical to that of the units in the World War II games, even down to the tanks. He gave every team tanks. Tanks weren't even really a thing until later in the war. Granted, there is a rule that says you can't buy a tank until round four, but not everybody had tanks. Germany, France, and Britain were the only ones who had tanks, and Germany only had like a handful of them. Now, don't get me wrong, these game sculpts are pretty awesome, but they're all the same, like every single chick flick ever. The only units that are actually nationality specific are the infantry units. Now, this is a stark contrast to what you'll find in many other Axis and Allies games, so that's a pretty big bummer. And where are all the horses? World War I had an incredible amount of horses, an astronomical amount of horses. This I just pulled from a Risk game, but it's pretty easy to get horses involved in this game. So it sucks that it's not there. There were also Zeppelins, blimps, hot air balloons, I mean, all that stuff, which gave a massive spotting advantage to the team using them. Where are the rules involving gas attacks, trench foot, influenza? World War I was all about technology and warfare outpacing the commander's strategies. Where is the tech upgrades? Where is everything World War I in this World War I game. I got a little disgusted with this whole situation, so what I did is I made a card deck, which includes a bunch of World War I tech upgrades and added rules to flush this game out, make it really awesome, and make it a game that you can come back to and experience new stuff in a different way. So make sure you check out those links when that goes live, it'll be down in the description. Now let's, just for a minute here, get back to the plastic units. There is simply not enough of them. The initial startup setup of the game, you basically use all of your units. And so you end up having to pull out placeholders for when you buy that massive stack of infantry and don't have any units to place on top. My personal favorite is uh, the KY Jelly. This map is absolutely freaking gorgeous. I love this map. The colors, the way it sits, the way Africa's perspective is, it's, it's freaking beautiful. And it was actually one of the reasons why I wanted to buy this game in the first place. The problem is the map is actually wrong. Greece never bordered the Ottoman Empire ever. This old-timey Africa look, spot on. But they got a few things kind of weird for the setup units at the beginning of the game. There's an infantry and an artillery here, and there's an infantry here. And the German base here was fairly significant in size, and it was actually never taken. So this territory should have a lot more units on it. Also, if I'm not mistaken, they had a cruiser on the west coast of Africa. Now, if you have any other setup issues that you found, let me know in the comments down below. Oh, another big beef about this map is that there's no room right here in the middle of the map. If you get enough units in here contesting, stomping on each other's feet, 
overlapping each other's territories and all-out war happening in here, you can't figure out who belongs to freaking who where. This is literally what it looks like in that situation. I'm not even kidding. This land is so tiny, but look at how big Russia's swaths of empty territory are. We couldn't have played with the perspective a little bit, giving us more room here and a little less here because who cares about this? Let's look at this gem right here. This is the Caspian Sea. It is sea zone number 30. It does not have a sea port, so you cannot build ships here. Also, you don't start with any ships here. So why is that labeled a sea zone? One more thing we're gonna cover about the board is the IPC tracker. But let me show you how the IPC tracker is supposed to work with French national markers. France starts with 24 IPCs worth of territories. So you'd put one here on 20, and then you'd put one on four. Great, that seems simple enough. Let's add Austria-Hungary at 26. The Ottoman Empire, 16. The Russian Empire, 25. Do you see what's happening here? After you get all of the nationalities on this IPC tracker, it is a freaking mess, completely unreadable, and a massive joke in the Axis and Allies world. This is a lot like your mother telling you supper is ready for you in the fridge, and then you open the fridge and realize it is an unopened can of pork and beans. There are a few things you can do to remedy this though. Uh, you can steal an IPC tracker from another Axis and Allies game if you have it, or you can draw up on a piece of paper something similar to this. This money, it doesn't exist. It did not come with this game. I stole this out of another game. This game wants you to write up a ledger on a spreadsheet and keep track of who bought what and how much money they have on a piece of paper. That means that you've got to invite the CFO from work every time you have a game night so that he can keep track of all these accounts. Come on, Hasbro, Wizards, Avalon Health, you're killing me. You had to cheap out, you couldn't throw me some freaking Monopoly money in the box? Guys, this slantedness adds zero fun to the game. Larry Harris was trying to be accurate with his history but it definitely comes at a price. What really ends up happening in this situation is you end up chaining your best players in your game group to the central powers, never ever to be seen again. And if you don't, the whole thing pretty much dies in a ditch. Now, because of this slant, you absolutely have to play the Russian Revolution rule. Now, the Russian Revolution in real life in World War I was a big freaking deal. And in this game, it is a massive rule catastrophe. In order for the Russian Revolution to happen, Russia needs to own Moscow, or at least have it being contested. Now the Central Powers has to own at least three territories adjacent to Moscow, and also own one original Russian territory. Now this rule is active after turn four in the game. So that turns Russia into a team that just spends the entire game trying not to get removed from it. If the revolution happens, the central powers are not allowed to continue battles with Russia or declare new battles with Russia. Meaning that the central powers won't be able to take any Russian lands from Russian units. So all that IPC money underneath all those Russian men just kind of leaves the game. Also, any contested territories don't generate income for anyone. So those also exit the game. But the central powers are allowed to move units freely through these contested territories as long as they keep a man there to keep its contested status. So there is a massive rule mistake, dab smack in the middle of the Russian Revolution that goes a little something like this. All Russian units outside of original Russian territories or Russian controlled territories are immediately removed from the board and Russia will no longer have a turn. 
So what the rules are saying is that you remove all Russian units on any contested territories outside of the motherlands and also Russian units in territories where you are just chilling with your allies. But the word or is not the word and. Our good friend Larry Harris incorrectly used the word or, turning the rule into a decision that you have to make. You have to decide if all of the units outside of the original Russian motherland are immediately removed. That would be your option one. Or you decide if all of the Russian units outside of Russian controlled territories get immediately removed. That would be option two. Also, he doesn't define what original Russian territories are. Does that include Romania or Serbia? I know they're the same color, but technically they're minor powers. If you are the Russian player, you can use the Russian Revolution as a bit of a weapon when deciding which option to choose. Now, if I wasn't clear earlier, when the Russian Revolution happens, all Russian units stay put. They exist now, and you cannot attack them. In the lands that they're on, are worthless. So if the revolution does happen, my suggestion would be to take off all of the excess Russian units on the map and only run one unit in each territory that needs one. Trust me, it helps with the clutter quite substantially. But you can really see how this is a giant mess, like how the game is supposed to simulate insane death tolls associated with trench warfare, but then charges you three IPCs for one man. I mean, Italy only starts with 14 IPCs. I mean, standard infantry are just too damn expensive. Men were pretty cheap to train in World War I, and the tactics, they just threw them at the enemy guns whenever the lines got too quiet. The standard infantry unit was extremely disposable. And this game does not make them disposable in any way. An infantry unit should cost one IPC, should attack at one, and defend at two or less, straight out. That way you can get masses of men on the board, and it definitely feels like intense, loss-heavy trench warfare. Planes, on the other hand, uh, I think that they should be taken down a peg. A plane, when it has air superiority, upgrades all infantry in the battle to a four or less, which is insane. Uh, I think that a single plane should upgrade a single artillery piece, making it a one-to-one -one, instead of one upgrading as many artillery as you have. Now, while we're talking about overpowered units, let's talk about the battleship. Uh, the battleship has the ability to bombard on an amphibious assault, assuming that the battleship has not been in sea combat for this turn. Now, when it bombards, it gets to do so at a four or less, which is insane because you roll that like 60% of the time. It's as though you climbed up onto the massive deck guns, mounted yourself a little 2x scope, and just started clicking heads. Bombardments in war do happen, and they happen a lot, but they don't do anything. Battleships do very little in actually killing people with bombardments. Sure, they'll hit infrastructure, but mainly what they're used for is demoralizing the enemy. So rolling a four or less on an offshore bombardment is absolute insanity. Sea combat, on the other hand, is a bit unrealistic. Germany starts their turn before Britain, and Germany and Britain have navies right next to each other at initial setup. Germany takes the first go at the British Navy and almost always destroys it, which is, like, ridiculously historically inaccurate. You see, there is only one major sea battle in World War I. There was only a couple of ships lost in that battle. Most of the major powers that had capital battleships didn't want them there at all. They wanted capital ships to deter the other nationalities from attacking them. So if they lost their capital ships, they would be open to attacks. So most of the time, these things just sat in harbors doing nothing. World War I was less about naval battles, and it was honestly more about shipping lanes. So if we look here, the British Empire was starting to get whittled down, so the U.S. was shipping over supplies. You see, unrestricted submarine warfare was a big deal in World War I. Submarines used to follow the prize rule. They would stop a ship, board it, get all the crew off safely and onto a safe vessel, then search the ship and scuttle it or sink it if they wanted to. But with unrestricted submarine warfare, 
They didn't do any of that. They just launched a torpedo at it and sank it. See, the Germans went back and forth with the whole prize rule thing. They did the prize rule, then unrestricted, then back to prize, then back to unrestricted, as even the Germans found it a bit barbaric. This game actually covers very little to the extent that the Germans went with unrestricted submarine warfare. It was devastating what they did in the Atlantic. You can put a submarine on sea zones two, seven, and eight, and then during the British or American collect income phase of their respective turns, you can roll a die getting a two or a one and you hit a convoy and you cost one IPC per hit. So you could get up to three, three IPCs per turn, whittling them down. It's, eh, it's all right, but that's the representation of complete unrestricted submarine warfare. There should be more emphasis here placed on the convoys and the civilian shipping and how subs just totally trashed it. But you only get three. You only get three opportunities to cause damage. It's not even that much. The US is isolated and does not enter the war until round four, unless they get attacked or Germany declares unrestricted submarine warfare directly in the faces of their enemies. Or just Gary from accounting, because if you remember, you had to invite him out so he could keep track of the money ledger. The US cannot be attacked and they cannot attack until they are brought into the war. Except for you can totally hack it. There's a way to get the US into the war even faster than waiting for somebody to accidentally attack them. And that is neutral territories. You see, neutral territories like Greece don't have a standing army. If they're attacked, they immediately fight back and they arm themselves with the opposite team's units. Turkey attack Greece. Greece would then arm itself with allied forces. It doesn't say that you have to use a specific nationality. You could totally just hack this and put the US as the mobilized force in Greece and then promptly proclaim that the US was suddenly and deliberately attacked, unprovoked. And bam, the US is now rocketed into the war. It's kind of the same way that your friends show up at your door ramming an MLM down your throat unprovoked and BAM! They're no longer your best friend. Because submarines don't constitute a hostile sea zone, another thing you can do is you can actually use the US to mobilize troops. If we go down here to Portugal, the French get some extra troops, then the US can move down to Albania, giving Italians an extra three men and an artillery. All of this is allowed within the rules, but it doesn't have to be like that. There are some resources already online to make this game much better. One of which is historical board gaming. Check out the link below. And you can also pick up pieces that don't come with the game, like Zeppelins and that kind of stuff. But if you wanna see what I've done to help out this game, you can check out the deck linked below. I'm working on it right now and it's got technology upgrades, it's got new rules to fix things, it's got introduction of new units, like sneaking some risk horsemen in there to make the game that much cooler. And that I never have to use KY Jelly as a unit placeholder again. I wanna say thank you for watching. I did this video to show you the bad side of 1914 and where it can improve. I would say buy this game, play it again and again, and most of all, have fun doing it. If you like this video, make sure you tickle my thumb, hit that subscribe button, and I will see you on the next one. Ciao.